Hi, welcome to Into ETV. I'm Peggy Robinson. Today's guest is Aaron Green, and his near-death experience was just before his sixth birthday. So, Aaron, <laughs> feel free to start wherever you like and take as long as you like, and we'll talk about it. All right, thank you. Uh, well, I'll give a little bit of background about myself. Uh, I was born in uh, Durham, North Carolina in 1975, and when I was uh, two, my parents moved to Chesapeake, Virginia. Um, I, you know, spent most of my life in Virginia, and I uh, went to Virginia Tech and got a degree in electrical engineering, and I'm married with uh, three teenage kids and a dog, and I work as an electrical engineer on, uh, uh, I work at Newport News Shipbuilding on uh, aircraft carriers and submarines for the, uh, basically for the U.S. Navy. Um, so my experience happened when I was uh, shortly before my sixth birthday. Um, I was playing with some friends in a uh, neighbor's backyard. And, you know, we were just, uh, you know, back then, kids just kind of roamed the neighborhood. And, you know, we were just playing, doing kid stuff. And somehow I, uh, I, I couldn't breathe. Um, you know, one minute we were just doing kid things and then, Next thing I know, I, I just can't breathe. And no matter what I do, um, you know, I'm unable to take a breath and uh, I become increasingly uh, upset and frustrated. And, um, you know, I'm not, I'm not sure exactly what caused this, but, you know, I just I could not breathe. And I, I started trying to walk home, um, but I only got, you know, 20 or 30 feet away from my friends and um, the breathing problem didn't get any better. And. Uh, it triggered something, you know, I didn't, I didn't pass out or faint, but I actually, my consciousness left my body, you know, my, my soul, my consciousness, my thoughts, you know, who I, who and what I really am left my body. And I was able to watch and, and see my, my body fall to the ground. Um, and so I was just uh, kind of like floating there next to my body. And, um, you know, as I was floating there, uh, a, a couple of things were immediately self-evident. You know, one is I'm more than just this this physical body that's uh, now lying on the ground. That was that was self-evident. And um, also, I was uh, it, it was kind of like waking up from a dream. Only th this physical reality that we live in was the dream. You know, and I was waking up to a uh, a higher state of consciousness. Um, I was more alert, more more intelligent. Um, you know, it, it, it was, it was better than, than being in this body. Um, it, it was kind of like being liberated or, uh, you know, uh, taking off an uncomfortable garment almost. Um, it, it was preferable to, to this kind of existence. You know, my, my body was healthy and, and good other than the breathing problem. Um, but it was still, not, <laughs> it was still a relief to be, uh, to be, to be out of it. Um, anyway, uh, another thing that was that was self-evident right away was there was something about time. Somehow the flow of time in this reality w was a little different than uh, than what we are used to here on Earth. You know, living as people, it was just it was just fundamentally different, and that was that was all self-evident. Um, I looked over at, at my friends that I've been playing with, and I could see them, and and they didn't realize that anything had happened to me. Um, but what had seemed so important, you know, all the stuff that we were doing, it now seemed just completely trivial now that I was, uh, you know, existing like this as a, as a, as a soul without a body. Um, almost immediately, my, my entire life, those, those six years of life replayed for me um, in extreme detail. Uh, you know, I relived my entire life from birth all the way up to that moment. Um, only um, the 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 difference that really stands out is that not only could I feel you know my feelings and thoughts from uh, from those six years, but I could also feel other people's thoughts and and their emotions and how I had, had affected them. Like like I really felt the feelings that I had caused other people to have. And, and as a six year old, it was mainly my parents. Um, a, a couple of things really stood out from uh, from that that replaying of my life one was my my mother's love for me you know that really stood out that uh uh it came across as as you know this is this was important that she loved me and that it was uh um 
you know, from a spiritual perspective, it kind of seemed small. And yet at the same time, it seemed like it was important. Like it was, it was fundamentally in, in, important and, and um, significant enough that it had an impact on, on like the whole world, you know, just that love that she had for me. Uh, and then also my, my father's frustrations really, uh, they, uh, they came across, you know, as, as a, as a baby, I would cry and, you know, have a dirty diaper, that kind of stuff. And I could really feel my father's frustration and sometimes anger at, uh, you know, dealing with that. You know, I, I um, it, it, it also came across that even though I had caused those frustrations for my father, like it wasn't my fault. And, and that was like self-evident during this, uh, th this replay of my life. Um, I had not done anything deliberately wrong. So I didn't like, um, so, somehow that seems significant that, that even though I'd been the source of this frustration, I hadn't done anything wrong. Um, anyway, it, it, it was, uh, it, it seemed very brief, you know, those six years of life, uh, it seemed extremely short from the spiritual perspective. Uh, it, it, it felt like I had done absolutely nothing, you know, but like, like, like the life was that six years was like trivial. I hadn't made any significant uh, decisions. I hadn't, you know, I hadn't, I hadn't done a whole lot. Um, anyway, you know, when, when that life review was over, um, I could have looked at more details if I'd wanted to, I could have explored any kind of, uh, any aspect of my life that I wanted to, it was, um, you know, it was there for me to, to look at, but, um, I was more interested in the greater reality than I was in those six years of life. Um, so I, I started looking around and I noticed a, a bright light in the distance. Um, it, there was something about it that I knew was very important. Um, th there was some kind of deeper meaning there, but I didn't, uh, I didn't remember what that deeper meaning was and I didn't pursue it. You know, I, I, I looked at it and knew it was important, but I, I turned my attention elsewhere. Um, and so I was back to, you know, floating, floating there next to my body, just kind of aimlessly, uh, almost like wandering around a little bit. Um, and I started to have uh, questions, you know, I, I questioned what had happened and, and what was going on. And as I would have a question, I would get, get answers. Basically I'd be shown stuff or given answers that, that answered my questions. And, and the first question I had was, you know, what am I? Uh, you know, I knew I wasn't this, this human. I knew I was more than this body that I had been living in, but I didn't understand what I was or, or what was going on. And um, I was able to, to see myself as, as this spirit at the time. I was basically a round orb of consciousness. Um, it, it kind of reminded me of an egg as a child when I was later trying to understand this. Um, just, just kind of a round orb. And there was a faint light coming from, uh, from myself, from this orb. Um, you know, faint but noticeable. And uh, there was kind of a, there was like a deeper, there was more parts or a deeper meaning to, uh, to, to this round orb, but I, I didn't understand them and I, I couldn't really explain them, but that's how I existed at that point was just as a round orb of consciousness. Um, and, you know, after I, I looked at myself and saw that I was just this round orb, I thought, okay, you know, <laughs> that's cool. That's fine. Um, and then I thought, you know, where, where did I come from? Cause I knew that, you know, I came from something before this, uh, this, this human, this person I had been living as, um, and a memory came back to me in, in extreme detail. It's like, I re I re experienced this experience that I had been through previously, but I'd, but I'd forgotten about while living as a person. Um, so it, it kind of like flashed back and, and, I re-experienced this and it began as I was, uh, I was a round orb of consciousness, a soul, just like I, I was in, in that situation. Um, and I was back with um, hundreds or thousands of other souls and we all existed together in a, a, a group of souls in this uh, extremely bright, um, you know, just, uh, I guess I would call it a, a sea of souls and we were all bathed in light. And we were, you know, we were happy and content, but we were also so extremely ignorant. Um, and that, that was my earliest spiritual memory. You know, we, we just kind of all existed together and there was, you know, nothing could ever go wrong and there was no problems. 
you know, everything was great, but, and, and we were, you know, relatively happy. We were content. Um, and uh, periodically a, uh, some kind of treat would come down for all of us. Like there would be one treat for every soul. And we all knew, we all knew what we were getting. It was something that made us happy somehow. Uh, as a kid, it reminded me of uh, like getting a cookie. You know, it wasn't something you needed, but when you got it, you, you know, you were happy to get it. Um, and, um, you know, one time these treats came down for everybody and there was one fewer treat than there were souls in this group. And I made the conscious decision that, okay, I, I, I knew, we, we all knew that there was one fewer treat than there were souls. And I made the conscious decision uh, that all these other souls around me, that are just like me. And I'm going to pass up my treat so that all these other souls can get their treat. And all the, all the treats came down and every soul got one except for me. And, and after the last soul got the last treat, I was very, very gently lifted up out of this, uh, the sea of souls. And, um, uh, I, I was communicated with like a, uh, it was like a mind to mind communication, like a tele te telepathic communication. Uh, you know, it wasn't words or, or audible, uh, but, but a, a, so somehow a higher level entity uh, communicated with me and basically communicated that what I had done was very important. You know, that it was, that it was a really good thing. What I had done, given up something that I wanted for the benefit of those around me, like, like that was really wonderful. Um, and th this, entity communicated that it was my creator that it, it had made me and that um i was loved and and cherished and, and important and you know not just that i was important but but all these souls were important um and that um you know for, for simplicity i'll just i'll just call my creator god um god communicated that um there was a wonderful wonderful existence prepared for me and for all these other souls and that, um, you know, there was a, a terrific, you know, just wonderful uh, experience before us. But, um, but I wasn't really ready to appreciate that, that the, there was uh, um, some, basically some stuff I had to do to prepare myself so that I could fully appreciate what God um, had prepared for me. Um, as I understand it, the, the explanation I got was... Um, uh, you know, we were created with free will and um, in order to appreciate everything that, that God had in store for us, we needed to freely um, embrace the godly characteristics that, that God had. Um, you know, God was loving, forgiving, compassionate, kind, um, generous, you know, and in order for me to to fully appreciate God's wonderful um existence that, that that was ready for me i needed to you know exercise my free will and and also choose those same things those loving uh those loving attributes that god already possessed um you know it, as i understand it or, or understood it we, we were like uh, you know a tiny piece of god and um we have free will and in order to appreciate this experience we have to um or, or we need to freely embrace all these godly characteristics. Um, so I asked God, could, couldn't you just change me? Couldn't you just make me like I needed it to be so that I could appreciate all this stuff? And God's response was, yes, absolutely. God could certainly change me uh, and make me like that. But it would. Uh, but, but we were fundamentally created that free will was an important part of our creation, that we were not created to be like mindless servants or, or slaves of God, but we were created uh, that we would be able to freely choose what we wanted. And that that was like a core principle of our creation. Like it was very important and God wasn't going to violate that free will uh, and change me into uh, this uh, kind of soul that I was supposed to become. But God had prepared a, a, a journey or a, a, a school or whatever you want to call it for me that would, that would, allow me to freely reach this, uh, these type of characteristics that, that were necessary to appreciate what God had uh, in store for us. I said, okay, you know, okay, that sound, sounded okay. And I was, I was extremely ignorant at the time and God was extremely loving and wonderful and powerful. And so I accepted everything that, that God said. Uh, and God asked, God basically said, you know, this is going to be difficult. 
Uh, but you will get, you, you know, by going through this experience, we'll get through all the difficulties of our existence. We'll get them out of the way. And then we will be able to enjoy without, uh, you know, limitation, this extreme, uh, extremely wonderful existence. And, uh, uh, you know, I agreed to it. I said, okay, that sounds good. And God was very pleased with me uh, that I had agreed to, to go, go through this. Um, God was absolutely confident that this was a good idea, that, that this plan was perfect. You know, this wasn't, uh, it, like this was really, really well thought through this plan. You know, I, I know living life, it doesn't feel like that, but in that, in that moment with God, it really felt like, like I could feel God's confidence that this was a good, a good plan that it, it you know, that it was, it was good. Um, and so after I agreed to, uh, to this experience, God asked if I wanted to, to see God's face. And I, I, I agreed. I said, okay, you know, sure. Um, and so my attention was turned away from these, these other souls that I had been looking at. And it was, it was turned towards um, a very similar scene with a whole bunch of souls together bathed in light. And um, these souls were much, much happier. And they were like, um, they were like fully evolved souls. These were souls that had been through uh, the process that I was going to go through and they had, they were now mature souls and they, uh, uh, they all existed together in the sea of light and they were extremely, extremely happy, much happier than I had been uh, when I started out. And uh, there was, you know, millions and millions of these souls. And um, some of these souls came to, they, they like came to the surface and, you know, and looked at me and they, uh, they understood, you know, what I was and, and, and that I was just starting out. And basically they, they welcomed me and they were very happy to see me and they were, they, they knew the difficulty I was going to about to go through, but they also knew that eventually I would, I would return to them and join them. And so they were happy to have me and, and they were happy that I would eventually join them and, uh, you know, be, be with them and enjoy the, uh, the kind of happiness that they were enjoying. Uh, and they, they wished me well, basically. And, you know, kind of like, hey, we'll, we'll see you later. Uh, and so then God asked if I was, you know, are you sure you're willing to go through this? And I, I said, yes. And with that, it's like I was off at great speed. Um, it kind of felt like I was going away from God into something different. And um, it, at that point, I, I saw a lot of different places I could go to. There's like a whole bunch of different planets that I could go to. Um, they were all, you know, different, but the, uh, from a spiritual perspective, it was all very similar. Like, like I could have gone to any one of these planets and had, had the kind of experience I need. And it didn't really matter which one I picked. Like I could have picked any of them. And after going through and seeing thousands of different planets, finally um, I saw earth and there was something about earth that appealed to me. I don't, I don't remember what it was, but I was absolutely sure that this is where I wanted to go. Like I was positive. And God basically said, you know, are you sure? And I said, yes. And with that, the decision was made and earth is where I was going to go. And with that, this memory ended and I was back to, um, you know, floating there in, the, in my neighbor's backyard, kind of just aimlessly wandering around. Um, and uh, with that, I, I had the question, you know, well, why, why am I Aaron? You know, how did I become this person? And just like before, this, this spiritual memory came back to me and I relived the, uh, the experience that I had previously had uh, before I was born. I had been with some guides and these guides were helping me, uh, you know, transition from spiritual in, into this physical reality. And they were helping me, uh, you know, select the, the kind of person I would become. And at first they showed me a body, I, a person I could become. And this person was going to be very angry, uh, you know, a very, very angry person. I don't know exactly why. Um, maybe there was some kind of difficulty in their childhood or, or, or something. I, I don't know. But this person, their whole life would be dominated by extreme anger. And I just completely rejected that, that, that life. I said, no, I'm, I'm not going to do that. I just completely refused. And the guides, they respected my wishes and, um, you know, basically agreed, okay, you know, we'll, we'll find something different. 
And uh, I knew that that some other soul would eventually choose to to live a li- live this life and, and become that person, um, and that it would be helpful for them. But I, I didn't understand why anybody would choose that. But I knew that someone eventually would. Um, and so the guides showed me a, another family nearby, and um, you know I could become become a, a child to them if uh, if that's what I, I chose. And so I began looking at the the kind of uh, uh, children that they could they could make the kind of child I could become in person, and uh, I saw that they were um, they had the genes available to them that I could become a redheaded girl, and I really liked the uh, the idea of being a redheaded girl. The uh, you know I had seen this angry person and I was concerned. I, like I didn't want to be violent. I didn't want to hurt other people. That was very important to me, and somehow I knew that that women were less prone to violent to violence. And so that's, that's what appealed to me. That's what I wanted to, to be. Um, and I liked the, uh, the red hair because I saw that it was very, uh, you, you know, it was pretty rare and that, that I really liked that. I wanted, you know, I wanted to have like a unusual look. Um, but there, so, there was something about the genes available to these parents and, and my personality or my soul's personality. Somehow the, uh, it didn't quite work out the 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 groupings of, of my personality and the and the bodies available for this redheaded child and um if i had chosen that like my personality would would always be like a little bit off and for whatever reason i wouldn't be able to uh get married like like i i you know I, i'd be uh just a kind of a little awkward maybe um and so th- that was kind of a deal breaker for me i i, I wanted to get married and, and have children. So I, I passed up on that and said, you know, okay, well, what, what about the, the male redheaded children? And I was shown that there was even less options for male redheaded children for, for these parents. And I thought, okay, well, you know, what about, what about a different hair color? And they, there was oodles and oodles of options available to my parents for brown haired boys. And so, you know, we started looking at the options available to them. And I said, uh, you know, okay, I want to be really good looking you know, like, like the best looking guy on the planet and the genes were available to my parents. I could, I could choose that. And so we, we looked at that and there was, there was a really good looking guy I could become. And uh, that option was available to me, but my guides basically, you know, pointed out, um, you know, the, the, where you are spiritually. And if you're a really good looking guy like this, um, you know, there's going to be opportunities available to you. Women are going to treat you a, a certain way. And essentially, I would choose to become too promiscuous. I would, uh, I would, I could, I wasn't able to, I would not have been able to resist certain temptations that would have been available to me as a really, really good looking guy. And spiritually, uh, I recognized the downside of that and, and basically agreed, okay, that, that's not a, that's not a good choice for me. Um, so I chose to back the, the, the attractiveness down to, um, you know, a, a little bit attractive, but nothing, uh, you know, nothing remarkable. Um, you know, I know at, at, at 48, maybe I'm not that good looking, but as a younger guy. Oh, you're gorgeous. Was, <laughs> you're gorgeous. Thank you. Uh, you know, at your age, so I can say that. <laughs> uh, you know, as a younger guy, I was, I was attractive, but nothing, nothing ridiculous. And that, that matches the choice that I made, um, you know, when I was picking this body. Um so I, I ended up settling on something that I thought was, was, you know, kind of attractive, but nothing, you know, not nothing uh, crazy or, you know, I wasn't going to be a supermodel, <laughs> nothing like that. And then uh, we started looking at the uh, intelligence available uh, to, um, you know, for, for the bodies. And I wanted to be like the smartest guy on the planet. I wanted to be, you know, like a complete genius, a super genius. And I saw that that was available. I, my parents had those genes. I could be ridiculously intelligent. Uh, but my, my guides pointed out, hey, there's, there's a downside here. Um, you know, I was shown how I would become arrogant, um, how I would be kind of a loner. I would look down on pretty much everybody else because they, they weren't very intelligent. Um, and I would also become an atheist. Um, and that was just unacceptable to me. You know, that was not where I wanted to get, be spiritually. So likewise, I, uh, you know, back the intelligence down to something that was intelligent, but, you know, nothing, uh, nothing extraordinary. Um, I'm not going to, you know, I'm not, I'm not making any groundbreaking uh, Einstein type uh, revelations or anything. 
anyway, uh, so when I when I found what what I considered to be the right intelligent, uh, you know, that's what I, that's what I picked. And, uh, you know, the guides would have let me make any choice I wanted as far as the in intelligence goes. Um, and I, I, I pretty much settled on what I thought would be the, the right body. And, and the guides pointed out, you know, these these genes you've picked, there's a an unintended consequence as a, as a side effect of what you're picking. Uh, this person will have horrible acne as a teenager. And I, I took a look at that and um, basically I saw that for a couple years as a teenager, I would have really, really bad acne, you know, like like the worst one percent kind of kind of acne. Um, but I also saw that that acne would actually help me spiritually, like it would help me develop and, uh, you know, help me achieve my mission is, is how I viewed it at the time. And also, you know, two years of, of horrible acne, it seemed like it seemed trivial. It seemed like nothing from that spiritual perspective. You know, two years for us feels like a long time. But when you're a, a, a soul looking at a life like two years really seems like like next to nothing. So I, I agreed to, uh, to the acne. I, I felt, okay, that that's okay. Um, and, um, you know, I, uh, I chose to have, uh, some strong traits in like math and science. Like I'm an engineer and I, I, um, I don't know exactly how that worked, but it's kind of like, I, I, I picked the kind of attributes that this body would have the, the kind of, uh, I don't know, natural abilities, the stuff I'd be good at. And that's what um, seemed like the right fit for me. Um, I felt like with those attributes, I'd be able to be beneficial to uh, society. And that was, that was important to me. And, and somehow it all seemed to work together pretty well for, for what I was looking for uh, with life. Um, and then, uh, you know, my guides had some, some stuff to, to show me about, about life. Um, we took a closer look at my parents, you know, I needed to accept that these parents were, uh, that, you know, that I was okay with having them as parents. And, um, you know, we took a, a look at my, my mom and, um, I saw that she had a, uh, you know, a spiritual agreement with one of her sisters. And that was a, a key element of her life. Like that was all shown to me. This isn't even something my mom knows about, but it was shown to me, um, when I was picking the kind of parent I wanted. Um, and I, I we, we looked at my dad and he was um, a, a good parent, but he has he had anger issues when I was growing up. He would he would yell a lot when there was not really a good reason to. And my guides basically pointed that out to me. Um, but there was other attributes about him that I really liked. And um, I felt like it was a good fit. And and um, but I needed to agree that that I would accept that he had anger issues. And I, and I did because uh, I felt like it all it all worked together well for for my life and what I was looking for. Seems uh, like picking out a game piece. You ready to play a game? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And uh, I was showing my brother. Uh, you know, I knew what kind of person he would be and and how our relationship would be. Um, you know, I have a brother that, that is two and a half years older, and I I knew that uh, when I was picking this life. Um, I knew uh, I knew what this body was down to the most intimate detail. I had an understanding of the, the personality I would have, even the, even the kind of clothes I would wear. Um, and anyway, when I, uh, when we were finished picking this, this body, the, uh, the guide said, okay, well, there's uh there's also some stuff planned for this life. Um, you're going to, uh, you know, your, your nose will be broken when you're a teenager. And they, they showed me what that would be like. And, um, you know, I needed to agree to that. It was it, it was of a sufficient enough uh, difficulty that I had to agree to it. And same with uh, a shoulder. I uh, I dislocated my shoulder, and I was shown that I would get, have that injury, and I needed to agree to that. And then I was also shown that I would uh, you know dislocate and break my other shoulder, and that was also something I needed to agree to. Um, but I was also shown that the uh, technology existed that they would be able to you know fix my shoulder. And, and I agreed to all that. And there was other stuff that they wanted me to do that I didn't agree to. There were some things that I turned down uh, that I, I said, no, I, I don't want that. Uh, I kind of wonder now, you know, would it have been better if I agreed to what they, you know, everything that they had proposed to me, because it would, I guess, help me with my spiritual development. But anyway, we, we reached kind of a compromise on all these things. And, and I agreed 
to, uh, you know, the body, the family, some of the difficulties that were, were already planned for this life. And, you know, when I, uh, when I agreed the, the guide said, okay, are you sure? And, you know, I had a final chance to, to reevaluate everything. And I, I said, yes, I'm sure. And when I, you know, just like previously, when I, when I said, yes, I agree, then that was it. We, the, the decision was made. Um, and with that, the, uh, the memory ended and I was back to, you know, floating near my body. And I had another question. Um, you know, I, I, I knew that at some point, you know, the, the body I was living in would die and that everyone else would die eventually. And so I had the question, you know, what, well, what happens to souls, you know, after they're done with life, you know, what, what happens to them? And so I was shown a number of different scenes or, or places or realms where, where different souls go. Um, I saw a realm where, um, you know, this was kind of a, this was a very unhappy realm. Um, I saw souls that were, uh, that had lived, you know, they had lived a human life, but they were, uh, they were like violent towards each other. They, uh, they wanted to kill each other, essentially. Uh, these were people who, who in their life, they really wanted to hurt others. And when they died, they still wanted to hurt others. And God, respecting their free will, allowed them to continue to do what they wanted to do. Only they were, you know, they were with each other. And uh, they looked, uh, th their appearance was really ugly. They were these hideous uh, creatures with, uh, uh, they had like claws for arms. And they were, they were really ugly and they were, they were miserable. And they were just fighting with each other constantly. Um, and no matter how badly they would hurt each other, uh, their bodies would quickly heal. It, it, like it wasn't a permanent injury. The, the, the pain and suffering was far worse than what a person could have on earth. Um, but their healing was like immediate, you know, not immediate, but almost immediate. They would quickly recover from any injury, no matter how bad. But they were just absolutely miserable and they hated each other. And they, they had absolutely no hope that anything would ever change, that their existence would ever get better. They were completely miserable. Um, but while these souls were fighting with each other, one of them made the choice to stop fighting. It, it basically chose to stop fighting with those around it. And when it made that choice, uh, there had been some, some beings of light or, or high level souls or angels. I'm not sure what they were, but anyway, one of these angels or whatever that was uh, above this big fight scene swooped down and pulled this soul that had stopped fighting it, it pulled it out of this big melee and uh i was told that they had a way for this soul to continue to progress that that none of these souls were going to be trapped there forever uh that there was a way for all of them to get out when when they were ready when they themselves chose to stop trying to kill the, the ones they were with and then i was shown another scene um a, a scene of uh you know, it was like completely dark, but but I could I could make out some of these souls that were standing around. Um, I I speculate that they were they had been atheist in life, but I'm not sure. Um, but they were they were just in complete darkness, and they weren't they weren't miserable, but they were a little bit unhappy, and they were very confused. And there was um, some higher level souls of, that that had a light to them. Um, they, they seemed like they were. Um, happier, higher level souls that had come down to this realm to try to help all these, these souls that were lost and confused. And, um, you know, these, these higher level souls were offering to help these lost and confused souls, but the lost and confused souls, they were mistrustful and they were not the type of, of soul or, or person that would help someone else. So for them, the idea that someone would be there to help them was very confusing and it was it was like foreign. It was it was outside their way of thinking. So they had a lot of trouble accepting that, that someone would be there to help them. But eventually, uh, one of the souls that was that was unhappy accepted the help from the, the higher level soul and agreed that, that they would go with this higher level soul who, who had some kind of way to help them. Um, and when, uh, when they agreed to the help, the, the higher level soul took them away. And they, they had some kind of way that this unhappy soul could continue to progress and get better and uh, improve or, or whatever. And I was told again that every one of those souls that were there, eventually they would accept help. And eventually they would be able to, uh, to progress. And I, I saw uh, another scene where, um, or a realm where unhappy souls lived and they weren't miserable, but they were they were generally unhappy 
and it looked a lot like Earth, uh, except I knew it wasn't Earth. Um, they had buildings and, and roads, and all, the buildings were kind of ugly, and the, the roads were just dirt roads, um, and it was kind of dark. You know, it wasn't a happy place, but it also wasn't, like, absolutely miserable either. Um, and I was told that, you know, that those souls would eventually get out of that place and move to, to happier places. And I saw another place where um, it looked it looked like Earth, but it was like a happy a happy place. Um, the, uh, the buildings were pretty. The streets looked really nice. Um, the souls there were all very happy and content. And, um, you know, it, 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 it was much happier existence than what we have right now on Earth. And then uh, there was another realm I saw where there was like a, a city of light, like everything in the city was made of light. The, uh, the souls there were like a translucent, beautiful um, yellowish color. And the buildings were, were translucent. You could see through them and they were all made of light. And the, and the whole city glowed with this beautiful light. Um, and then uh, also, as I had mentioned previously, the, the souls that, as I understand it, were with God, um, you know, they were, they were all together and there was just each other and, and God, and they were extremely, extremely happy, you know, the, the happiest of any of these souls that I saw. Anyway, um, as I was, when this was done, I was back to floating uh, with my body. Um, and I somehow it occurred to me, I was like, oh yeah, I remember now when I'm done with this life, I can go home. And to me, I thought home was this, uh, city of light that i had seen and i also remembered that i had friends and that i could rejoin with my friends and that that made me so unbelievably happy this idea that i could could rejoin my friends and i i rem uh i knew or, or remembered that um th there's like a, a trait about souls that are happy they can kind of like merge together you know humans we we have like a, a sexual merger that that's good um, but souls have have a deeper merger that's much more significant, much more pleasurable. And I, I remembered that and I was I was really looking forward to it because I had some friends and, and, you know, we were I don't know, we'd be happy. And I, I kind of even thought, why on earth did I ever leave that? Um, anyway, while I was thinking about that and I was filled with happiness of the idea that I could go back to that a high level soul or an angel or, or something like that, you know, this, this this being didn't have a name tag and didn't explain who they were, so I'm only speculating, but I would speculate it was some kind of angel, um, you know, a very bright, extremely, extremely beautiful soul came at me at great speed and communicated with me, you are not to leave your body. It was like I was being rebuked, like I had done something wrong. Um, as I understand it, my, my breathing problem should not have been significant enough for my soul to leave my body. It was kind of like I had misbehaved as a soul uh, by doing this. I, I, you know, I'm not sure. I'm just kind of speculating here. But anyway, as, as soon as as soon as that was communicated to me, it's like bam! I was back in my body, and I, I you know, I, I stood up, and my breathing problem was gone. And I was I was confused about what had happened, and at that point, my brother had had come over to see what was wrong with me because I guess from his perspective, my body was just laying there on the ground for maybe about 30 seconds or so. But when he saw me stand up, he uh, he just went back to play with the friends. You know, he figured, OK, he's fine. Um, so then I, I went home and I, I tried to explain what had happened to my, my mother. Um, but, you know, at the time I had a, a speech impediment. Uh, you know, there's a lot of I had years of speech therapy to learn to, to talk better. And I, I was, I'm kind of an introvert, you know, I, I, I didn't, I wasn't good at explaining myself. So I, I, there's no way I could explain this to my mother when I was six years old. So she didn't understand what I was trying to say. And, and I gave up trying to, trying to explain it, but I would think about this experience like daily, you know, I thought about it a lot. And after maybe six months, um, the, uh, the, the guide that I've been working with or, or guides, they communicated with me, uh, you know, mind to mind communication again. And they basically said, Hey, uh, we're going to need to hide your memories. They're, they're interfering with your life. Um, you know, this, this is, uh, basically it's interfering with my ability to live life the, the way life is supposed to be lived. And that because I had seen so much, I could never develop faith. It's like, it's like I had knowledge of God 
and that would prevent me from ever developing faith in God and that faith in God is very important. Um, and I didn't understand. So I, I asked, you know, why, why is faith important? I, I want, you want people to know all about God. And the answer I got was yes, they, they want people to know all this stuff, but for me specifically, you know, to develop some faith was very important and that my experience prevented me from having faith. So, so anyway, I agreed to, uh, have my, uh, those memories hidden from me and I was assured that I would eventually get them back. And, um, I was also shown that, that, uh, or, or told that there were some changes to my life plan based on what had happened and that some things would be more difficult for me. And I had to agree to it, which I did. Um, and, uh, then after that, I, I didn't think about, you know, my, my experience at all. Um, you know, I went through life, I, I grew up, um, and, uh, when I was 12 years old in seventh grade, I got into a, basically I got into a fight and had my nose broken. Uh, that was a very difficult experience, but, uh, you know, at the time I had no memory of, of what had happened or, you know, what I had agreed to. And then, uh, when I was 19, I, I dislocated my shoulder and, uh, you know, it, it got better, but I had no idea that I had agreed to that injury before I was born. And then when I was uh, maybe about 35, I, I broke and dislocated my other shoulder and uh, had to get surgery to get that repaired. And, uh, you know, it got better. It's, it's pretty good now. Um, but I, I had no idea that I had agreed to that kind of difficulty. Um, and then uh, about 10 years ago, I was um, reading a uh, magazine, a, a, a newspaper, uh, I'm sorry, a Newsweek article uh, about even Alexander. He's a uh, a neurosurgeon who had a near-death experience. Anyway, I, I was reading his uh, this article about him in, in Newsweek, and when I was done reading the article, I thought, wow, this is really cool. You know, I kind of uh, accepted the existence of God on a deeper level. Like, I had, I guess, more faith than I had previously. You know, I, I accepted the story that even Alexander had shared, and I believed it, and um, I thought, wow, this is really cool. I guess, you know, we're all, we're all going to... Uh, continue to exist after our bodies die. And um, there's something about that that triggered my memories to come back to me. And I, I had, a, I guess there's a term, spontaneous recall, something like that. Anyway, all these memories that had been hidden from me for most of my life came back to me. And, you know, I spent the last uh, 10 years trying to understand all the stuff I'd, I'd been shown and, and try to, you know, a, a appreciate it. And, uh, you know, now I'm trying to, to share what I, what I saw with others. So, you know, that's, uh, that's the gist of my story. So when you saw God, am I understanding correctly? He was a sea of people. It, uh, yeah. What I saw was kind of like a sun like entity. You know, it looked, it looked literally like the sun, except there was, you know, millions and millions and millions of souls all merged together you know, with God, they were like part of God. Um, they were, they were simultaneously their own um, entity and yet simultaneously merged with God. Um, uh, you know, I'm not, you know, I, I can't really do it justice, but yeah, basically it was a whole bunch of souls all together with God. Like each soul was a tiny piece of God. Did you ever see anything other than that? Any kind of form, a face? Uh, well, well, the souls that I saw, all they all had a face. Um, and so what I saw was the face of God was like millions and millions of individual faces okay. all, uh, all together. What about his voice? Was this telepathic or did you hear an audible voice? What I, uh, what I received was like a telepathic communication. Um, so it wasn't like an audible voice. Um, what I remember about god's uh you know that, that communication was god was extremely loving and kind and compassionate and, and cared about me deeply and that god was very you know confident and uh powerful and you know all, all the different attributes of love you could think of like all of those were embodied by by god and, and the way that i was treated uh during those interactions when you saw the article about eben and then you remembered it all what was that like uh, that was really, uh, kind of shocking. Um, it was kind of a, an, oh, wow moment. 
like like to have those memories come back after all those years and be like oh my gosh you know how did i i, I kind of like couldn't believe i'd forgotten it um i i was really happy to 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 get that knowledge back you know this is not something that i had remembered and to to have to have those memories back was very important to me and it really helped uh it really helped me to, uh, I think, become a better person. And, uh, you know, I feel like I have a better understanding of, of what life is all about and how I'm supposed to live life. And I think it's really, um, you know, helped me to to make better choices uh, since then. Did the memories come back all at once or bits and pieces? What was that like? Um, I guess I'd say maybe half was like all at once. And then half was kind of like more like bits and pieces as I've, as I've thought about, the, you know, I've thought about this a lot. And, um, you know, bits and pieces kind of, kind of trinkle in here and there. Um, but it, so a little bit of both, you know, maybe half all at once and then half kind of tr trickled in later. What was it like when you started telling people? Who did you tell your <laughs> wife or? Yeah, yeah. So I've told a, a number of people, um, I guess generally the response is polite bewilderment, um, you know, it's, it's, it's rare that, that someone really understands what I'm saying. Uh, mostly this is, I think, so outside of normal day-to-day -day conversations that they're just not sure what the heck to make of what I'm saying. You know, I've had, I've had some really, some people get really give me some crazy looks, you know, I'm sure some people think I may be insane or, or something like that. Um, uh, so, you know, it hasn't all been good. Let's put it that way. There, there have definitely been some bad interactions related to me trying to explain what 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 I've been through, and uh, you know, I, I I try to respect that. I, you know, if someone doesn't want to hear my my uh, experience, I don't I don't push them at all. Um, but I think it's important, and so I, I try to share it if I can. Uh, you know, with anybody who's willing to listen to me. It's kind of like a thousand NDEs rolled into one. Okay. That same stuff we've heard before, here, there, yeah. here, and there, everywhere. It's so into e typical, but it's just a thousand stories put together because usually it's just a, a smidgen here, smidgen there. But okay. you got the whole gamut. Like I can identify, I drowned when I was five, so I can identify okay. the out of body stuff that you went through. And then my 25 year old into e, I can identify somewhat because it's so different from what you had but um but oddly um a little tiny obe i had a couple years ago when i was sick and it just it was a like a sea of people i wouldn't okay prob i probably wouldn't name it sea of people there was like a bunch of people and they were so happy like they're having this big party but there was no social distancing everybody was real close <laughs> together oh yeah and just chat 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 and i thought what? What are you saying? I want to hear what they're saying. I want to be included. And that something let me know, like curiosity killed the cat. If I continued to listen and want to participate, I wouldn't come back. And my husband's right. like, baby, baby, you know. And so I come back, listen to him. And so I can get little parts. And then I can, and the rest of it, I can get from other NDEs I've heard. And um, you have a very detailed NDE. It's kind of like everything you ever wanted to know about NDEs and one NDE. And I love that. Yeah. <laughs> uh, you know, one, one area where I think mine is a little short is the, uh, the life review, you know, because I was only six years old. Um, you know, my, my life review was less, uh, I think involved in a lot of people's, um, but you know, there's still a couple of important pieces there, I, I think, but yeah, the, yeah. the, the, the pre-life uh, planning, uh, those memories that I have, I think, are, are more than what most uh, NDEs. That's unique. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think I've it's heard a unique little bit, that. but not that detail. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that that's part of why I want to share because I think uh, I think maybe I've got one puzzle. You know, I view these NDEs as like a bunch of puzzle pieces, and you know, if you put them together, it's pretty pretty clear the you know clear picture of God and and the purpose of our life and how we're supposed to treat each other. I think it starts to emerge. And I think maybe I've got, you know, one puzzle piece that, that can help put it all together, uh, along with all those other puzzle pieces. Were you afraid to talk about this in public because of where you work? Um, yes. So, uh, you know, I, 
you know, the, my type of job, I need to, um, um, uh, you know, I'm trying to word this carefully, you know, mental fitness they, they, matters. They could, they, could, they could fire me if they thought I was crazy. Let's, let's put it that yeah. way. And, and people could think I'm crazy because I'm, because of what I'm saying. Um, and, you know, I, I don't think that would happen, but I guess it's not outside the realm of possibilities. Um, but, you know, I judge this to be like, I think these are very important experiences that people have. And I think it's important to everybody uh, that I try to share what happened to me, just, just explain what happened to me and uh, share it with anyone I can. And, uh, you know, I'm going to do that. If, if, if I get fired, so be it. Uh, you know, I, I'll get a different job. It's okay. Um, but, well, they're going to fire Evan yeah. Alexander too, and Mary Neal and, you know, all these doctors sure. and, and yeah. heads of colleges that are saying the same thing. Yeah. You know, there's, there's millions of people that have these experiences and uh, yet somehow people still don't, some people still don't want to hear them. I recently retired and so I had to go through the social security stuff. And so they had part of it is to have a psychiatrist interview you on like zoom yeah. or whatever. And uh, I mentioned my podcast and she says, Oh no, we don't want you to give that up. You're helping people. Okay. And good. I thought this is psychiatrist for social security that is telling me, don't give that up. You're helping people. She says, you're helping yeah. people. Like I help people. And I felt like I had my stamp of approval from the government. <laughs> that this yeah, is it's, okay <laughs> it, it's really nice after you know so many people who just they don't understand the experience i'm trying to share you know when you can talk to someone who who appreciates it it's it's kind of nice have you heard of george ritchie I've, I've definitely heard that name yeah okay um he's got a little book i think it's free online he's dead now um it's called return from tomorrow and it's my favorite little NDE book, but, but you can look on YouTube. So he tells a story on like I think little TV programs, but um, you know, he was in the military, had an NDE um, pronounced him dead, everything. And he had this whole elaborate NDE. Well, years later, he was a medical doctor and he decided he wanted to come out about his NDE, but he was, um, he was starting to talk about it. And he decided he would become also a psychiatrist, even though he has a medical yeah. degree. And he had to go in front of this review board. And they asked him about his NDE. And he stuck to his guns. And they said, if you would have wavered off of it, we wouldn't have, um, you know, admitted him. But because he stuck to his guns about it, they uh, they accepted it and accepted him and okay. become a psychiatrist as well. Okay, wow. So, so that's, you know, we got some things like that in our back pocket to let people know if they start this crazy stuff, you know, they're yeah. just crazy. They're, and you, you know, know I, why I, would we do it? Why, I, why you know, would I couldn't we blame anyone up? for thinking I'm crazy. Like, sure. Okay. You can say I'm crazy, but there's millions and millions and millions of people saying the same stuff that I'm saying, you mm -hmm. know, people from, from all walks of life, all over the planet, you know, all ages, you know, males and females, there's millions of people saying exactly the same kind of stuff I'm saying. And if you, if you want to ignore all that, you can, but I think you're, you're missing out on, on a real fundamental truth that, that I think would be helpful to everybody. A big confirmation for me to start really taking these seriously was my son, Jeremy, he's in his forties now, but when he was five, he slipped in the um, creek and was drowning and I was frozen in fear and I was praying and I left my body and I think it's because I left my body before from my drowning right, right. and because I just I was praying so hard I was so scared this fear that it was like I left my body and suddenly I was in this I call it land of knowing where we were we were out of our body as kids and I had the, I said I just had this knowledge I just knew oh because I didn't know what was happening his older brother yelled mom Jeremy and so I didn't know. So I'm just praying. I didn't know what was happening. And all of a sudden I knew, oh, Jeremy fell in the creek. Usually the creek is just ankle deep. We've had a lot of um, melting snow and rain. It was Easter. And it's um, swift, but it's not that deep. If he would calm down, stand up, he'd be okay. But he was drowning. And, and his dad was running, trying to find out where the boys were. And I'm standing on the hill, frozen in fear, praying. And all of a sudden I just start praying to Jeremy. Like I'm praying to him in a prayer instead of God. And I said, Jeremy calm down, stand up. It's not that deep. Walk out of there. 
So when he was about 20 years old, he's had a New Year's Eve party. And I told that story for the first time. I had never talked about it. And I don't even know why, you know, it brought come up. And he stepped out of the kitchen. I didn't know he'd it would hear me. And he said, Mom, I heard you praying. He says, that's what it was. I panicked. I was trying to swim through that current. And when you said, calm down, stand up, he says, that's what I did. And everybody in the room, you know, were mouths just gaped open. And I'm like, what? And so it wasn't right then, but like, because I, I don't understand this. Later on, so many things started adding up to this stuff's got to be real. And But that was the main thing it was like, OK, my son, Jeremy, I know he don't lie. And he's a very honest person. He would not say that he heard me praying if he did not. And he still to this day says, yeah, I did. But he says, but maybe I heard you talk about it, mom. You know, and I just, re, you know, retold the story. I said, Jeremy, I had never talked about it before. Right. So because he's trying to rationalize it, trying to make sense. How did I hear this? Because he don't be all woo woo. He's accountant for the federal government. <laughs> right. So. But yeah, there's those confirmations. And and like, I understand, like you reading that on Evan and it triggering because mine was in, I had watched Oprah Winfrey. She was new at the time and she had okay. people on talk about NDEs and I rolled my eyes and I, oh my God, how stupid do they think people are? Oh my God. And I took one <laughs> step to go in the kitchen to start dinner. And it's like, you know, a ton of bricks hit me in the face. I was like, why is that sound familiar? And I was like, oh. Like I took a deep breath. Oh my God, it was real. What happened to me months before when I was 25, right. died of an ectopic pregnancy, that was real. Oh, and I shook all over. It's shocking. Yeah, yeah, shocking. Yeah, it's definitely shocking for me when I got those memories back. So, what'd your wife say? Uh, uh, she wasn't sure how, she, she's not sure how to handle it, I guess. Uh, I, I think she believes me, but she's, uh, you know, she's unsure how to take the whole thing, I think. My ex, so I told him that night when I, after the Oprah, he said, um, I know how it sounds, but I know you and I believe you. Okay. But then, you know, I didn't have the name, like near death experience to run the library and look it up. I had nothing. I never heard of it. I never knew yeah. any, I thought it was the only one I ever happened to. Okay. So how could you expect people to believe you? So you yeah, just, it's nice nowadays. There's, yeah. you know, people have written books. Yeah. You can read, read them or, or watch a YouTube video. And, uh, you know, there's easily thousands, if not, you know, tens of thousands of, of accounts out there that, that people can see. And, uh, you know, I, the way I see it, it's like each one's a little puzzle piece. And if you, you watch enough of them, it, it really starts to create a clear picture of, of life and God and, you know, what we're supposed to do here and how we should treat each other. Yeah. And, you know, these fit the Bible. There's a lot of Christians yeah. and pastors telling people that this is Satan and we're false prophets and stay away from it and don't believe it. But I don't see why it doesn't fit the Bible. You know, if you look at what Jesus said, and you, if you look at what near-death experiencers say is important for how to live life, they line up, they line up pretty well in my book. It almost seems, I listen to you talk, it almost seems so futuristic to pick out your body, pick out your personality, pick out your right. family, everything with the accidents are going to happen. The trials uh -huh. you're going to have, pick them all out. Uh, and my, yeah. Yeah. I, I think if you think about it, like God's, God is not going to force, as I understand it, God doesn't force people uh, to do stuff. God respects our free will and allows us to make choices. And uh, you know, why would anyone agree to some of the stuff that happens in life? Like why on earth would I agree to have my, my nose broken or my, my shoulder broken? You know, well, it, it helped me spiritually. It, it helped me in, in, to become the, uh, the kind of soul I'm supposed to become. And, um, Go ahead. It, you know, it's like, it's like going to college, you know, I became an engineer and I took some really hard, hard classes in, in school. Why on earth would I agree to those hard classes? Well, you know, they were necessary to get me to where I wanted to be and, and I didn't enjoy the mm -hmm. class. Um, but it, it was necessary and it, it ultimately helped me. And it's kind of like that with life. And then also, you know, life, when you're, when you're a soul looking at life, like a year, two years, the whole life, it seems really, really short. And it's really hard to, as a human, it's hard to appreciate how brief life uh, is from a spiritual perspective. And so, you know, we're willing to, 
it's kind of like ripping off a Band-Aid. You know, yeah, it hurts, but you can actually get it over with pretty quickly. And, and I know it doesn't feel like that to people who are going through really difficult times, but but spiritually, that's that's how it appears. It's weird because the other day I was telling my husband, I said, you know, I have this strange memory when I was 14. I was in my bed at night and like I was talking to somebody in my mind very clearly. And I've remembered it off and on over the years, but really didn't really talk about it too much. And it's like something was asking me, if you had to have a scar, where would you want it? And so I was thinking that brought to mind what, how you were talking. And I thought, well, I wouldn't want on my face. I wouldn't want it anywhere visible. I, and so I thought, well, I guess real low, like where your bathing suit would cover. Of course, I end up end up having C-sections. Okay. <laughs> okay, this is weird. And then I remember um, when I was pregnant for my second child and my ex was trying to force me to get my tubes tied. When he was born, I did not want to. I wanted, to, I wanted 10 kids. I always said that. And then his voice said to me, do you want so many kids that you're just like, excuse my language, just like pooping them out and they don't really matter? Or would you like to have just a few and they are everything to you? And I thought okay. about it. Even though I always said I wanted 10 kids, I thought I want a few that really matter. And so I, I can identify with some of what you're saying. Well, everything okay. you're saying really, but. Yeah. So life's a mystery <laughs> for now. <laughs> but it's nice yeah. to have these little insights. And when people finally get the courage and then the technology to be able to share, because yeah. we all want to know what to expect. Yeah. Yeah. I think, uh, you know, listening to uh, people and their near death experiences, uh, I think you can really get a, get a lot of insight into what life's all about and, and how we should live. Uh, and, and, you know, if you, talk, you, you mentioned the Bible, like a lot of the stuff in the Bible, I, like, I wonder if that was someone who had like a near death experience or an out of body experience, you know, two, 3000 years ago. And, you know, we've kind of lost track of who that person was or, you know, you know, we can't talk to them or interact with them, but you've got millions and millions of people you can listen to that speak the same language that, you know, they, they, uh, you, you know, you can talk to them in person and, and get a, a, a a real like current, you know, live uh, rendition of, of of some of these, you know, spiritual uh, uh, spiritual facts that I think to me they they uh, you know I connect with them better than I think I do with someone's account from two thousand years ago. You know, not not including Jesus, but maybe some of the other stuff. And why would uh, all the miracles and things that happen? end with the bible at the end of the bible why right, wouldn't they right. continue then, just because no one's recording they it clearly don't yeah they, there's clearly you know there, there's near-death experiences where the person has a, a medical uh, uh miracle as part of it and you know obviously you know god's still still doing stuff with us you know this didn't stop two thousand years ago and uh, uh i certainly don't think the revelations from god have stopped either and uh you know i've heard People talk about, you know, they asked for something and then it was given. It's like they had to ask first. Yeah. Yeah. Like, uh, I, you know, I don't think I think God respects our free will so much that like God's not going to force something on us. We, you know, we need to, to seek it out and ask for it. And what you said about miracles, so many into ears saying I was the only one on the ward that didn't die of COVID or I. They right. said this is not possible that this happened, that you're okay. Like the guy I had on the other day that bit into a, a 110 electric cord. It was plugged in. He thought it was unplugged and had a big hole in his tongue, spoke coming out of his mouth and and knocked out his feelings. And and the doctor said he had the uh, them do the tests of the enzymes like four times. And he says, there's no way. He doesn't have organ damage. And he says, right. I'm not a religious man. He says, but you go and count your blessings and you just had a miracle. You know, you hear it time and time right. again. It's like if you've had an NDE, there's going to be a miracle healing. You know, Anita Marjani or, you know, the list goes on. And people that have yeah. these quick healings. And it seems like the hospitals should come to know. And I think the nurses do because my mother-in-law was a nurse. And she said, oh, yeah, they, they knew. Like if you had an NDE, you was going to have a quick healing. Okay. So, yeah. And uh, if you listen to hospice nurses, uh, they talk about, uh, I guess, what's called deathbed visions, and it's kind of similar. Where you know people who are about to die, I think their their spiritual vision opens up, 
and they've, they, you know, we can get some information about the other side from, from these people with their, uh, you know, when they're dying. Um, you know, and I, I think if you put it all together, it paints a pretty clear picture of, of what's going on with our life. Well, I appreciate you coming on and sharing your stories or anything else you didn't get to cover or you want to add? Uh, no, that's all. Uh, you know, if anybody wants to contact me, uh, you can find me on, on Facebook, Aaron Thomas Green. I'm easy to find. Um, but yeah, I, I appreciate you letting me share my story. And, and I really uh, appreciate what you're doing with your channel and, and trying to share these uh, experiences. I, I agree with your, uh, uh, what do you say, the uh, retirement person who, who said this is important. You know, I, I agree. And I, I think it's important. And, uh, you know, I think it's great what you're doing. Thank you. Keep sharing your story. Now, have you wrote a book? Uh, I'm working on it, but it, it might not be out for a while. <laughs> okay. Yeah, yeah eventually, right. I'll, eventually I'll probably have a book. Okay. Well, let me know when you do. And if you want to come back on, okay. we'll talk about it. Okay. All right. All right. Thank you. All right. Thanks, Peggy. Bye. -bye.